So what we're going to do is, uh, in the interest of time, I will not introduce everybody. You can, you all have a program. Um, if you're watching at home, I bet this program is up on the website as well. Uh, I will say their names, but rather than go through the whole introduction, I'm going to ask the the speakers to uh, do their speech, and I'm going to sit over there. And 30 seconds from the end, you'll hear a little beep, 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 beep. That means you've got 30 seconds to go, and uh, then. They'll step down. The next speaker will come up. We'll go in the order that people are in the program. And um, we're going we're to start with Kevin Millsup from the Vancouver School Board. Thank you. Hi, gang. Uh, my name is Kevin Millsup. I'm the Sustainability Coordinator with the Vancouver School Board. And I'm just going to tell you a quick story about a mid-scale composting experiment that we're conducting. So a little bit of context. We have 53,000 students, 6,000 staff. We have 109 schools, more sites than that, but 109 actual schools, 18 high schools, 91 elementary schools. Uh, we serve over 9,000 meals a day, uh, every day in the VSB. Uh, we did uh, some waste composition studies last year with Metro Vancouver, and we know that about 87% of our waste is divertible. About half of our waste is organic compostable material. So a couple of years ago, before I came on board, there was a decision made to begin to experiment with mid-scale composting in the district, because right now, all of, most of our organic uh, material just goes into the landfill, aside from really small-scale stuff that individual schools are doing. So. A few years ago, two years ago, we bought early 2009, the VSB bought three earth tubs. And earth tubs are, these are the devices here. We bought three of these. They're manufactured in Port Townsend, Washington, in Washington State. They're just under, slightly under 10,000 US a unit. We bought them and had them shipped up here. They arrived uh, in Vancouver sometime in the spring of 2009, and we, we uh, didn't get to it. We, weren't able to install them until the summer of 2010 because there um, was a lot of back and forth with CS, uh, CSA approval stuff. These aren't, some of these components weren't approved by CSA, and so we had to spend a lot of money and time going through some electrical uh, upgrades and stuff like that. So long story short, I just want to give you sort of what our lessons learned are. Well, they've been operating for most of this school year at three sites, two high schools and one elementary school. And our goal was to see if we could turn these somehow into community hubs. Oh yeah, I got a clicker. Um, right. Uh, this is just another shot of the earth tub. The waste material goes into the top of the unit like this, and then they're actually manually uh, manipulated by folks. There are, there are augers inside the earth tubs that uh, mix the material. Uh, just a shot of some of the material inside one, but you actually have to, as these two hardy gentlemen here are doing, um, you actually have to uh, physically manipulate the unit. So we have them at two high schools and one elementary school. And what we have found so far is that um, we haven't actually pulled a full load out of one of these yet. They have a fair, uh, a fair, a high degree of, uh, or lots of capacity in them, but we would not be able to make this system work without community partnership. And in, um, in one case, we partner with uh, Fresh Roots Urban Farms and uh, Grandview Elementary, and they, they're really making this system work. And uh, it takes all the organic compostables from that school site and now starting to look at incorporate, uh, incorporating compostables from the surrounding community as well. At Windermere Secondary, which is one of our other sites, uh, it takes all of the compostable material from the school itself, which has a teaching cafeteria, as well as from nine surrounding elementary schools. And what Windermere is doing, and again, this is the power of that school, they have a bike trailer system where uh, twice a week students from Windermere uh, get on the bike trailers in teams and they go to the surrounding elementary schools and then they, they, they bike the compost material back to Windermere and it goes into the earth tub. And they now have uh, an arrangement with a local senior center that they have a, one minute, all right. And so they're now taking some of the compostables from the senior center to Windermere to, uh, and then taking, they will take the product from Windermere back to the gardens at the senior center. Um, any learnings? Our learnings are this is a great pilot, but we're not going to buy any more of them because 
once we factor once we factor everything in, these units are actually extremely expensive for what we're going to get out of them. We need a district-wide solution for composting, yeah, and this isn't going to provide it. Uh, a great solution, I think, for a different kind of institution or a different kind of entity. So it's, it's a good pilot program for us, but not something that we will continue to explore. Um, because once we factor in costs and all that jazz, are probably over $20,000 a unit that cost us and something we can't afford. So, done. Thanks, Kevin. Tom, you're up. Uh, Tom McConkie will talk a little bit about soil. He knows a lot about soil. Let's not get carried away. So, which one of these am I moving? What I'm going to talk about is we're talking about compost primarily. And thanks to Dr. Sally Brown, it was great. And what I do is I blend soils. So I'm with Eco Soils. One in, some of my uh, esteemed colleagues are here from other companies, so you may hear somewhat of this, some of this repeated. But specific composts are used in specific ways. And this is one of the things that I really want to focus on in my brief time up here. And what most people don't realize in British Columbia is that most of the soils used on large-scale projects, large and small home garden, is compost-based soil. Much like it was alluded to with the swale material, it's all blended compost and sand. The sand comes from the river as a necessity because it's created and we're need, we need to harvest that sand, blend it with our compost. We create our soils. Very important concept. One of the reasons why we create soils is we are not legally allowed to harvest topsoil, which is a good thing. You can't go out and dig up your prime farmer's field, screen it, and sell it. You go to jail, as uh, Dr. Bill Herman will constantly tell me. So, let me see if I can... There we go. So I try not to be too controversial. In terms of composting is a good thing, first and foremost. It's always a good thing. But we want to try and target the use of our compost for specific purposes. One of my, some of the things I'm highly involved in are green roofs, which were alluded to, as well as urban food production. In those two exercises, we use very specific compost materials, often not only one single source of compost, but a variety of compost blended together to get specific attributes. So compost is rarely soil. Soil, I won't go into detailed explanation of soil science. I'm not a soil scientist per se, but compost most certainly is a component of the soil, usually in our world pre-blended, but as larger or more local uh, enterprises come on board, we're going to look at soil amendment as well. So compost is often used to amend soils. Not all composts are created equal. Now, this could, we could go on for a long time about this, but we want to use specific compost for specific use. Um, Biosolids in our region are not going to fall under OMRI guidelines for food production, for example. Yard waste compost in our region may or may not be specific to that purpose. Food scraps, I can't really speak to. Dieter probably do a better job of that. Uh, but different soils are targeted for some of the things that uh, Dr. Brown spoke of, bioswales, green roofs, urban food production, etc. Why am I having so much trouble? There we are. So as a soil blender, I don't compost a lot. I, we really don't compost. I buy compost for specific purposes. Now, there's a whole variety of things in our world that we have to deal with whether we want or not, and they come under the broad generic term, compost. It may be manures, it may be municipal biosolids, it may be uh, food scraps, etc. So we're trying to put together different materials to achieve specific horticultural values. And to that end, we're also trying to achieve the highest value for the compost, and the value doesn't necessarily mean only dollar value means across the board green values including, including growing plants correctly, etc. Now on this, we're, I'm going very quickly here as we have very brief time up here, but when you're composting, you're also inherently inheriting regulations, specifications, and criteria, whether you like it or not. Especially in our world, 
it's a quite a complex uh, discussion about where composting is going to be allowed, what's going to be composted, and what is going to be the end use of that compost. This is just a brief illustration because the organic matter represents your compost portion. It was great to hear Dr. Brown mention that we're going to be running out of compost because right now that's not the case here, but uh, we're trying to figure out what to do with it all. Now, to that end, this is a slide I throw up there so I can illustrate what is commonly thought of compost. You put all your organic stuff in and you get good stuff out. That is primarily correct, but we want to be a little bit more specific. My slide, my sli oh, there it is. I like this old computer phraseology because it really illustrates what we're doing. We want to be really specific as to what we put in our compost or what compost we put in our end blends in order to get what we want out of that. And this is very specific to food growing. Just time. Okay. That's just... So we won't have time to get into value versus volume, the different ways to move compost. This is very important. Compost is going to be produced whether you sell it or not. So you better learn to value your compost for specific use, make use of the triangle, highest dollar on the top, lowest common denominator on the bottom. It's all going to move all the time. There's some of the uses. We've already been through this. I'm thoroughly involved with food growing exercises and green roofs, including the current trend towards green roof food production. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Mateo Osejo is our next presenter who knows a little bit about the Gore technology that we just heard about. Thanks, Peter. This one? This one to go forward? Good evening. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit about processing some of that organic waste that everyone's been uh, talking about into compost and uh, specifically through the use of the Gore Cover System, which is a technology that is in use in Everett, Washington. And what we have there is uh, basically a Gore-Tex jacket that covers the material and encapsulates it so that none of the odor comes out from the... Uh, there we go. This is the Gore-Tex jacket that encapsulates the organic material and basically keeps all of the vapor and the odor contained within the material trapped beneath it. And here's an example of the odor reduction that's typically seen by using this type of technology. If you're going to compost complex types of waste, then you need to employ some type of technology. There are many kinds of technologies that will successfully manage odors. This is one of them. And as you can see, as time progresses, the odor of the material, uh, the odor intensity of the material decreases. But under the Gore cover, you're able to reduce about 97% of your order concentrations. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the technology. I've got a lot of pictures from a couple small-scale projects where we're composting very close to the city and very close to people, and that's what I wanted to focus on. But basically, you can see all of the heat and all of the steam and all of the energy that's kept beneath that cover. When the cover's in place, none of that steam, which is really where all your odor is, is being released to the atmosphere, and that's what allows us to compost quite close to our neighbors. And here's just a close-up of the uh, membrane inside of the gore fabric, the PTFE laminate, that is basically like a sieve and allows air to pass through the material, which we're doing an aerobic composting process, but it doesn't allow any of that moisture or water vapor to pass through the fabric. So this is the facility that was referenced earlier in, in Cedar Grove in Everett, Washington. This is not uh, a mid-scale or a small-scale compost facility. This is definitely a large-scale facility, one of the biggest. And this, there's many of these uh, being built, and these same folks are building another one in, in Oahu, in Hawaii right now, that uh, I'm working on. And they're all quite large. There are 100 and, this is 160,000 tons. They're looking to add 50,000 tons per year of, of biogas processing. The one in Hawaii is 120,000 tons. It gets a lot harder when you start doing smaller volumes because of the economics that somebody referenced earlier. So here's a small facility in Seashelt. This is very small. This is only about uh, 5,000, or right now in this picture with two covers, 2,500 tons per year. So what happens when you get to a very small capacity, it's difficult to keep receiving waste on a daily basis. So 
for this project, you can see how close we are to the neighbors, right across the street, literally. Um, and in this facility, we're composting fish waste. So we have a large asphalt pad where we receive the waste. We've also got a building where we can store the waste if we need to for a short period of time. But immediately, we basically process the material into a recipe and place it under the cover. So when you're dealing with such a small amount of waste, you really have to do it like a batch system. You can't be receiving waste daily from curbside collection. But this is what some of it looks like. We're doing sturgeon, we're doing trout, we're doing salmon, and uh, a lot of this, uh, a lot of different types of fish. There's a lo high concentration of fish farms up in the Sunshine Coast. So sometimes what you need to look at when you're looking at small types of facilities, where these are going to be built is, is there a lot of organic waste and is it a high cost of disposal? So up there, the cost of disposal is north of 150 For some of this waste, $200 per tonne. And that's why you can get a small-scale facility off the ground economically, because you can charge $100 a ton and save them some money. So there's lots of uh, photos of different waste that we're processing there. We've got eggs and large pieces of, of fish and some liquid wastes. And uh, we've taken a bunch of different samples and weighed them all and, and looked at how the waste broke down over time. The key with any technology, I know there was another slide about odor issues in, in Washington, is always going to be the operation. You can have the best type of system installed, but there's always going to be a potential to create odor. And that facility in Washington has been open for a number of years. They did just have some recent problems. Thankfully, we haven't had any problems here, but you have to have a well-trained operational staff. I'm going to quickly go through some more photos. Here's uh, some of the issues we've had with snowfall and freezing. Um, but some of the benefits include green jobs for band members on, on that specific site and obviously uh, healthy soil streams uh, and fish. Oh. So this is really what we're doing is for greenhouses. Somebody else had asked about uh, energy from the process. And in the, in the smaller projects, you can actually capture heat from the composting reaction and use that to heat things like greenhouses. Uh, on a smaller scale, it's harder to produce methane and use that for energy production. Real quickly, I'm just going to fly through some slides showing how close we are doing biosolids in Shimanis. That's the Trans-Canada Highway. It's about 100 meters from uh, where that building is. We've separated leachate and stormwater, sealed the building for a biofilter, and basically do the whole thing inside of a building without anybody knowing that we're composting 100 meters away from the highway. But obviously you can see there's a lot of, a lot of time and, and care taken to contain all of that odor. The Gore Cover is doing a lot of the work, but you've still got a building on top of that to make sure that nobody smells anything 100 meters away. That's it. Now we're going to hear from Louise Schwartz a little bit about the hauling side of the equation. Remember, all these people will be up at the end, and you can save up questions and um, fire away at them at the end until we all get too tired. Thanks. And is this the one with Schwartz? Hi. Um, great to be here and also have the opportunity to share the perspective of the haulers um, for getting this material moved from the source where it's being generated to the processing facilities and, and these kinds of technologies that actually most of the panel are going to be talking about tonight. So we've been doing this uh, recycling collections uh, since 1989 and most recently, the last two years, we started providing uh, zero waste collections and also organics collections to our suite of programs for clients. And so in that light, we have have a fair, an interesting perspective, I think, to offer as far as some of the challenges that uh, come up when you are hauling this material. Um, first of all, it can be very costly. Um, it's expensive and heavy to transport. The facilities, as we're hearing, are generally outside the mun municipal hubs where the material is being generated. It's um, very, uh, it, it's, it, it's very rough and hard on material, on, on equipment in the trucks because of uh, the caustic nature and acidity of this material. It's, um, it has to be handled in a timely manner uh, because it's live and it starts to decompose rather quickly. So you want to get it moving. Um, and all of this leads to higher costs because you've got higher frequency collections that are ne necessary at the site for the, um, for the client. Uh, then you've got issues like contamination and education and engagement to make sure that you can ensure quality control at the front end because contamination, there's a very low tolerance for contamination with this type of waste stream. Um, it's not like other recycling streams where if you can detect contamination coming onto your paper streamline, you can start to mitigate that and address it. So when we're working with clients 
at uh, their sites. And we're doing mostly commercial uh, or organics collections here is what I'm talking about. But this is a large component and this does need to be addressed. It's different from what's coming out of the backs of houses, but it's a significant volume. Um, you can see you we want to make sure we're working with best practices. And for us, what that means is working with smaller containers, tote containers, where we can see what type, we can detect any contamination if it's coming through. This ensures the quality control that's going out to the facilities, and it also um, allows us to um, uh, address any issues as they come up with the client and report back to that. Um, the other thing you're seeing in this picture is we use compostable, certified compostable liners for the totes in the collection because this material is very hard on the equipment that we're using. And so we're wanting to extend the life of the totes as we use them um, for, with the clients. Um, now, this is because we are able to work directly with a commercial client, not necessarily with various households, and I would not recommend a system uh, with compostable liners for households. But when you're working with high volume uh, commercial uh, 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 clients, you need to have something that can protect the tote. Um, again, uh, reduce things like seepage and, and leaking of liquids, oils, which are very um, smelly and messy and damaging to your toes. Better hurry. Um, also, just back on that, the education piece is very important for the client. Um, so just as we build out the capture on this, what, do, what helps facilitate the hauler is looking at central facilities, facilities where we can collect the material close to the hub and get it to the turnaround with local recovery. And just a couple of ways to address this that we've been working on the last couple of years at Recycling Alternative. We've designed a truck that is a single pass truck that can do both recycling collection and organics within one stop shop, and this is what Dr. Brown was talking about, this isn't three trucks coming out, and also things like a lot of totes at the location. It's not a one-size-fits-all fit, solution for commercial recycle, uh, organics. So you really have to start to change the mindset. These are some of the groups that are working in this direction already. These totes are the convention center, so it looks quite different from a one-size-fits-all. One Thank you. Five minutes goes by quickly. That, that was actually my alarm for my parking meter from last night that went off on top of my timer here. So, but thanks, Louise. You were within the five minutes for sure. <laughs> uh, Brian Leung is next, and uh, I just should say that I heard about Brian from Michael Levinson down at the City Farmer, who was uh, quite excited about Brian's technology that they've been working with, and I'm sure he'll tell you about that. Brian, hi. How are you? Um, I'm basically going to have to talk really fast because I've got about five minutes to do this. The technology itself came from Korea. It's been around since 1997. Uh, our biggest customer are the U.S. military and the Korean military. So basically, if you go to Korea, in every military basis, they're using our technologies. And what is our technology around? Basically, our, basically our technology is um, it's scalable, it's mobile. The, Interesting thing about our technology is that the technology would actually come to your food waste instead of the other way around. So our technologies are really a composting machine. It's an in-vessel composting machine. Uh, it's able to compost anywhere from a couple of kilo of food waste per day upward to about 10 metric ton per day. Um, speed, it's something that is unbelievable. Uh, when I first came across these technologies, I couldn't believe the compost actually take place within 24 hours. Now, it all depends on what you put in. When we talk about 24-hour composting, I'm talking about the normal food waste. And we're not talking about stuff like, you know, large animal bones or anything like that. But if you're talking about normal produce, protein, crustacean shells, meat, dairy product, it should be composted within that 24-hour process. It's extremely hygienic. Uh, it is done in an enclosed environment. Uh, it provides answer to bad smell and as, far, and as well as uh, pest control. Uh, the byproducts are basically H2O and CO2, um, and you don't require any water uh, because food waste itself have a lot of moisture content, and it's pretty user friendly. And as far as the offloading concerned, it's everything is a turnkey operations. You turn a switch, compost offload. Um, Aside from the very first beginning, when you start up your machine, you do not need to add further additive into the machinery. And it is also very economical. 
Okay, and here are some of what some of the local users have to say about technologies. Um, Mike Levinston, basically he's a big fan of our technologies, and as far as he's concerned, it's too ridiculously to be true. And the first time he came across our technology, he put footways in there, and yeah, 20, 12 to 24 hours, he looked into the same machines, whatever footways that was in there, it became compost. Uh, you would also see that a lot of our users have actually taken the compost to different soil lab testing. And even though I'm pretty new in this game, and I think one of the gentlemen was pointing out, when it comes to compost quality, it is about you know, garbage in, garbage out. So some of the compost, some of the lab tests we have came back actually contain a pretty high fat content because some of the food waste that we've been picked up actually contain a very high fat content. Now when you look at one of our customers, which is the city of Markham, Ontario, they have basically made the decision to go with our uh, technology with their, with their zero waste initiative. And their, their compost come back with a pretty good uh, result in terms of uh, having a high water holding content. So overall, um, you know, if you look at even from one of our customer, Keystone, uh, we have one of our machines operating on a commercials environment in a, in a uh, retirement residence up in Ed Edmund Kingsway. It's a place called Mulberry Center. So the machine is actually only being used at about 50% of its capacity. And even at that, Basis on their figures, the machines itself would pay for itself under a little bit five years. So if the machines were being used closer to 100% of its capacity, the figure would become closer to about two to three years in terms of you know, having your return on the investment. Um, the machines itself is probably not perfect. It's probably not the only solution out there, but I tend to believe that could be part of the solutions in terms of you know, neighborhood composting, as far as on-site composting, and that's pretty well it. So I actually did the whole thing in less than five minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brian. Well, the other part of all this, of course, is getting the people together who are all the different parts, and Aaron Nichols from uh, Farm Folk, City Folk, has uh, a project that works on that. Come on up, Aaron. Give me the orientation. Where's the button? Okay. Hi. Um, I work with Farm Folk City Folk, and since 1993, Farm Folk City Folk has been working towards cultivating a sustainable food system. And as we know, uh, a food system is more than field to table. It's also field to table to field to complete the entire system. And... Uh, what I want to talk today about today is food rescue and composting, which are integral parts of a sustainable food system. Metro Vancouver tells us that about 30 to 40 percent of the garbage that we send to landfill is actually food scraps, or food waste, I should say. And um, there are two different kinds of food waste, in, in my opinion. One is food scraps that are totally inedible, and of course then there's the food scraps that we, uh, food waste that we put in that is actually viable food. Uh, Quest, a uh, not-for-profit that, uh, that rescues food in Vancouver, says that they rescue about 15, no, sorry, $5 million worth of food that was destined to landfill. So what I'm proposing today is that composting um, and uh, Waste reduction isn't the only solution. It's also about rescuing food um, so that we can get that 40% down to zero. And uh, Farm Folk City Folk has brought two websites um, and launched them, on the, launched them that actually help to do this. We have Shared Harvest, which supports food recovery, and we have the Biomass Trader, which supports composting and other uses of this residual biomass. So how does it work? Well, essentially, they're Craigslist. How many people here doesn't, don't know what a Craigslist is? Good. <laughs> so uh, it's free to use. Uh, membership is free. And on there, you can put wanted and available ads. And on the Shared Harvest site, you can put up food donations. It's also a great place for workshops and events, and I suggest you take a look at it if you want to know what's happening in your community. So the ability to link what is wanted with what is available is a simple, and I must say, incredibly powerful tool. So, um, categories. 
Uh, on-shared harvest uh, is not just about food recovery. Uh, it, it's, there are classified ads that can be placed for a broad range of local food and agricultural products, and the food donations themselves don't necessarily have to be local. We do have pineapples that should be redirected to people's tables rather than food waste. And on the biomass trader, um, there's a number of categories as well, and I've just p sort of picked the high highlights. Um, bakery residues and coffee grounds that we're pretty familiar with in this city that loves coffee, and food scraps. Um, food, biomass trader isn't just for compost. It's also for anaerobic digestion and other uh, bioenergy um, solutions so that we can have renewable natural gas. And who's going to use this site? Well, you can, uh, these sites, you can see there's actually quite a bit of duplication. There's farmers and fishers and, you know, there's farmers and, you know, fishers on the other side, food processors and uh, distributors that actually have product that goes to waste as well. And, of course, um, what we're trying to do is, on the shared harvest side, direct uh, that, that food that could, can be recovered to the food recovery agencies that are helping to feed the hungry in our city. And on the, on the biomass trader side, you know, farmers and food processors that have waste, scraps and stuff like that, we want to uh, direct that to the composters and the bioenergy facilities that need those uh, feedstocks. And again, this is all just cl free classified ads. They put up a want ad and they put up an available ad. I've seen ads for uh, chicken manure and I've seen ads for uh, squash that was being donated. Um, and each of them go to the sites that are particular to these particular functions. So where are we? Um, there, you can place these ads um, in Metro Vancouver, Fraser Valley, the Okanagans, and the Victoria for shared harvest. And for the biomass trader, it's BC-wide. Um, and you can search on there for your, for your region and also look for cities. Now, um, some of the challenges have already been uh, touched on. Restaurants have a really hard time with uh, dealing with uh, compost because it can be smelly, can take up special, I mean, um, uh, limited space. So I'm working to, to find the best practices and to move this project forward. But as, with this panel, I've got a great list of contacts, and believe me, I'll be calling them after this. Um, I really want to thank our funders. You can see United Way. I Waste Not Systems supplies the trading platform, Friends of the Environment, um, um, and also the BC Ministry of Agriculture through Growing Forward, which is a program of the federal government. Um, and there you go, There's, there are the URLs, and I've got some cards if you want more information. Thanks. Thanks very much, Aaron. And now, all the way from Vancouver Island, Dr. Brian Imber. And I also want to just acknowledge somebody here came down from Kelowna, I was told. Is there somebody here from Kelowna? There we go. Uh, so thank you for coming down. And uh, we've crossed the water here for this next presentation. Go ahead, Brad. Thanks, Peter. I'm not really sure what to talk about, uh, as I've got a number of different things I could talk about in a few slides. Uh, ICC is a company that was incorporated um, in 2004 to... Uh, to compost uh, organic waste from both commercial and residential uh, sources. We have since developed other technologies uh, for heat, electricity, and now biofuels. And part of the reason for that is really the economics of what you can get for composted material rather than the nutrient uh, usage, which, which is an issue if you don't use it for, for compost. So we really have three technical pro, uh, um, platforms, and they're interlinked. The first thing we did is, is uh, large-scale composting, and the pictures below are of uh, our facility in Nanaimo. Basically, we take material, put it in these large drums, and uh, that's the start of the process. Uh, the picture above kind of gives you an overview of the process. So the material nearest my end is bagged material, it's from supermarkets, it's from post-consumer restaurants, and it's also from household collections. The first household collection in, in BC was in Ladysmith, and we had a 97% compliance in terms of uh, collecting organic material. So the material starts there, it gets mixed with uh, shredded green waste, goes into our large vessels, stays there for three days, the temperature in the vessel is maintained mostly from 
the bacteria activity. We do have uh, heating blankets on them, which we rarely use, to maintain a, about a 60 degree temperature. Three days in there um, at those temperatures deals with the pathogens. The material is then put onto a, um, a floor, a vented floor, where negative air. We're sucking air through, and for another seven days, we suck a lot of air through to, to uh, stimulate that growth. And then we move it to outside bays where it's also an aerated uh, uh, floor, but at much uh, lower flow rates. And the, the whole process uh, takes about three months, but we don't sell material, uh, at least up until this year. We, we haven't sold material until it was about a year old. Now we've uh, just uh, done a deal where we're actually giving all of our uh, material away to another company uh, as soon as it reaches the composted criteria because it will allow us to re reduce our footprint. And also because this is going to be our research facility for our two other platforms, uh, gasification of the same material to produce power and heat and, um, and also our, um, our biofuels uh, uh, technology, which I'll, I'll talk a little about if I have time. This is our facility in Scotland, same technology more or less, but in Scotland the rules are quite different. It's all based on uh, pathogen uh, uh, proof of, of, of dealing with pathogen con control. So in Scotland we have to heat the material, or the material has to heat itself, uh, to uh, 64 degrees uh, for three hours. Um, and again we have a similar system where we actually have the stuff in there for three days. So the, the, the drum can take 100 tons, and we put 30 tons into each drum each day. Uh, the, uh, what basically happens is like a flow-through batched system. And during the night, after you've done all your processing, taking out and putting in, leave it for the, for the night. And at the end of the night or through the night, there's a period where it reaches that temperature. And if it requires heat, it's given heat. If it doesn't require heat, it doesn't give, get, get heat. But the moment we do use the blankets in Scotland, um, we'll probably stop using them now. The material is a little warmer and more active as, as we get it in. And you, that material is the, the material at the end. In order to get good material, because of the, the plastic contamination and another, other contamination in the front end, we screen to a, a, um, a 3 8 uh, size range. Because we don't think that we can get rid of all the material, we've looked for other um, possibilities to do, with, to, to do with the material. And one is the production of uh, heat and electricity. And we have two uh, types of gasification technology. Uh, so one's a, a gasification technology and one's a pyrolysis technology that can deal with this material. Because you're really just looking at calorific value, you now have the ability to add other material that you wouldn't normally compost. So we also deal with things like uh, construction, demolition, wood waste that is, has a fairly high calorific value, can be augmented with this material. And uh, it also dries the, the, the average uh, moisture content, which is, allows us to, um, uh, to put the material directly into the gasifier. The gasifier we have is very adaptive. It can take material up to 40% moisture. If you, the more moisture you put into the gasifier, the more energy you have to use before you can, you can get it gasified. So it is a, a law of diminishing returns, and it's better if you can put the stuff in dry. Time's pretty much up, right? Okay, I'm just going to take, take a couple more seconds. We're, we're very excited. We've got $4 million from the provincial government for our biofuels project. We just got another $3 million. And um, what we're doing is we're taking the same material, turning it into gas, and then turning the gas using a catalyst into a very high quality synthetic diesel product and aviation product. From one dry ton of organic waste, we get 80 gallons of fuel. And that, that actually is the, financially is certainly the best option. Uh, environmentally not, and we still want to do part of it as compost. Thanks. We well, just get a taste of some of the options that are out there and, and the scope of the expertise locally. Um, Dieter Giesing will now tell us a little bit about what's happening at the biggest composting facility in the Lower Mainland. Good evening. My name is Dieter Giesing. Um, I live in Richmond, and um, I'm surprised when I talk to my neighbors that very few people actually know that one of the biggest, largest compost facilities in North America is right in their neighborhood. 
Um, we are located in Richmond, and we produce, we get something like 200,000 tons of uh, waste material into uh, our site. 80%, 85% is yard waste. Um, 5 to 10% is clean wood waste. The rest is food waste. And the food waste component will increase now with the um, increasing uh, food collection programs. Cities like Vancouver, Burnaby, um, Coquitlam started first. What is our advantage? Um, we are actually located, um, when I prepared that presentation, I was thinking, talking about advantages of a large scale towards mid scale. Um, I have to say that we are lucky. We are located on a formal um, landfill, and we actually use part of that landfill gas to run our engines already now. But I will later on talk also about um, our digester program. Uh, we are also lucky because the infrastructure allows us to access um, hauling um, trucks, and uh, there are also consideration of to using waterway and train to get a material hauled to our site. Um, we are surrounded by ALR land and industry, which is a major um, advantage in terms of odor control, um, having immediate um, residential people. Uh, odor is more a psychological thing than it is actually um, a fact. And um, so we are, um, um, so it's, um, we are actually uh, lucky that we are surrounded by agriculture that use manure, which is often um, more uh, an odor issue than our side. And we had, not, we had only one odor complaint over two years. Um, yeah, um, what we do uh, in terms of mitigation of environmental impacts? Um, well, we have a negative um, aeration system that we suck the air through. It's capped with um, cedar and, uh, and um, ash. And um, the, the gas are pulled through and into a um, biofilter. And actually, this biofilter is run with this um, um, landfill gas, uh, the, the, the engine, uh, the, the blower engines. Um, the advantage of having a large size is also a mathematical uh, model that uh, the, the circumference is much less, actually, uh, if you compare it to um, per unit, if you compare it to smaller sizes. You have a l larger um, uh, exposure if you have smaller sizes. Um, yeah, and then um, in terms of leachate, well, one of the things is the right formula, but also we have a system of dams and ditches and use a water purification loop, which is close by. You see that here on the picture. Um, yeah, another efficiency is actually um, thinking large. Um, this, um, we have a larger engines, so we don't run um, several small um, uh, loaders. We have um, several large slowers and not hundreds of small loaders. Um, another um, important issue is also that we actually, and this is a, something that's often blamed uh, on the um, compost industry in terms of the uh, life cycle analysis, the turning produces actually greenhouse gases because you, all, uh, you have fuel engines running. We have a static pile, we don't move them. From the beginning to the end, we don't move them. And that's pretty unique. And still, we get uh, actually an excellent compost out of it. Um, so high volume uh, allows also for consistent quality. And another aspect is, well, if you want to test, all the, if you want to comply with all regulatory um, requirements, this costs a lot of money. Um, we spend every year tens of thousands of dollars just um, to have material tested. Um, we also um, uh, have a lot of research done on the uses because, um, well, the market supports only um, a certain volume of um, soil. So we try to explore also other markets. And finally, um, another step, and that's where actually uh, I think uh, I can make a little bit the bridge to what um, Dr. Brown said before. Um, we, um, uh, we are now implementing also the, the two steps of um, digester and um, composting. So um, we are... Um, um, constructing the first um, high solids anaerobic digester in uh, North America here on uh, site. It's under construction. We will uh, extract the gas uh, component um, and use it uh, to generate electricity and the digestate, which is then in this um, uh, boxes, will later be composted. So the best of two worlds. 
there are some economic consideration. All this kind of capital cost can also be done, only be done by major companies and not by small. So this is a solution which is certainly only supportable by people um, or by a, a larger and corporate company. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Right on time. So our final presentation, John Paul, who uh, again thanks John Paul for sponsoring us tonight and uh, he's been around for a long time and I'm sure has a lot more than five minutes worth of material but he too gets five minutes. Thank you. I love dirt. It's, um, I'm a soil scientist and the reason I became a soil scientist is because I figured out in the early 1980s that it's all about the soil microbes. The soil, growing healthy soil is all about the microbes and the composting process is all about the microbes. And I love it. Part of this process, of course, and we're getting into this in Metro Vancouver, in my opinion it's about balancing what works and what matters. Lots of things work, but not necessarily things matter. But there are things that matter. And one of the things that matter is the soil and the health of the soil. The other thing that matters is growing healthy, sustainable food. The other, the other important thing that matters is the health of ourselves and of our children. So just so you know, it's just my, not my gray hair. I didn't go get gray early. Um, oops. My daughter here, uh, when I, when I started, she was three years old. Now she's in India taking uh, or, or getting uh, people out of slavery. So in that course of time, I've been working on soil and compost. So three things I want to focus on uh, this evening is what products can we make? Because that dictates how we make them. And how can we make the compost safely? And Third, can we obtain energy in the process? And we've heard a little bit about that. I have a few things to say as well. So what can we make with compost? Well, we've developed a lawn compost that's really transforming, I should say, the, uh, the lawn industry in Vancouver and, and creating a healthy soil. And we're able to deal with things like European chafer and, and other issues. So really been, been able to reduce the dependence on chemicals and pesticides. We also have been making and using compost to uh, produce soil conditioners and worm castings that produce more and healthier veggies. So the, the, the tomato plant on the left, for example, is grown by a master gardener who knows how to grow tomatoes. Uh, we added worm castings on the right, and these worm castings are made with Starbucks coffee grounds, so thanks to those of you who drink Starbucks coffee. And, um, the, the difference is really astounding. So in terms of getting success uh, for local, healthy, sustainable food production, there are things and tricks that we can learn. Also, we've been making a soil for the uh, BC Ministry, the Spuds and Tubs program. It's for the kids in the classrooms to, to learn where soil comes from. As Dr. Brown mentioned, the potatoes actually grow in the soil, not on trees, or sorry, the potatoes do and they learn about this. And part of the success of a, uh, a good potato harvest is um, a good healthy soil. And in this case, uh, it's actually the worm castings that made all the difference to get that harvest so quickly. So uh, when we understand what kind of products we can make, we can talk about the composting process. Uh, We've been involved with composting locally and also with food waste since 2006. And uh, we were involved in a, in a pilot project. Actually, uh, Dieter was involved with this project as well. And uh, we are able to do it very successfully and meet the, uh, the quality criteria. And it doesn't have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be foreign technology. Uh, we are very proud that all of our suppliers, or almost all of our suppliers, are Canadian, and in fact, all of them are local. So this was a, this was a challenging project here. It was a slaughter waste project. So this is meat waste. So this is, this is the nasty of the nasties. In fact, we got the first odor complaint four months before we started from, 
from 40 kilometers away. So you can imagine that there was a fairly high level of, of excitement and concern, and there's actually a website all about this as well, and it's not particularly friendly to me. Um, but the interesting thing is when we actually started, nobody noticed. And I'm very proud of the operators. Uh, this is in Salmon Arm. Their first and second batch not only met uh, the pathogen uh, reduction requirements, they were less than 10% of what is allowed for Class A compost. So my hat's off. I'm very proud of these, uh, these operators who we were able to work with. We're actually doing a facility right now in Saanich Peninsula for, um, for, a, for a private operator there looking to take food waste from Victoria and uh, that will be completed in about a month's time. And, and again, it's right in the middle of Urbania and we have uh, several levels of management and odor control uh, built into the process. And again, I'm very proud to say it's Canadian technology. We also have a contract with the, uh, the District of Mission to do their green waste and food waste program. So we're partnering them with them from the ground up or from the garbage can up, if you will. And they've coined a, a fun little phrase called the rot pot. Because a lot of people understand the word rot. If it rots, then it goes into the rot pot. And uh, so we're working with them on the, uh, the composting process itself. So can we obtain energy in the, in, in the process? Uh, we have a vision of heat recovery from the composting process. I have built an anaerobic digester, a pilot scale uh, unit a number of years ago. I think there are too many challenges. It's too finicky a process. And if we look at the, the results coming out of Europe, uh, what we're finding if they lose their subsidies for the process, uh, these things will all go silent. Uh, okay, thanks. And so imagine uh, eating organic strawberries produced locally in a greenhouse heated with a composting process. That's part of my vision for the future. Thanks. Well, a big thanks to all our presenters. I'd like to invite you all up on stage here, and we'll just wrap up with uh, your questions to any one of these people. Gosh, there were a lot of different uh, came, questions popped into my mind. I will ask you to use the microphones, and uh, we'll just uh, spend a few minutes tapping their energy and their uh, inspiration and their knowledge. First question. Should I just say who it's for, too, if you have a particular person in mind? Oh. Yeah, my question is for people who are collecting waste uh, or food fr from the kitchen. I, I see that a lot of uh, people who work in the kitchen are often not fed by the owners of the restaurants. Do you encourage them to feed their workers before they dump the food in the garbage okay. or in your recycling bins because otherwise uh, unless you are paying the owners of the restaurant to collect all the food I don't know whether you got my question so how, how do you educate the people working in the restaurants to put the food in the right place uh, or, or the owners to, to feed to give some of the food to the workers because a lot of these workers don't oh, get I'm sorry to give to to recover the wasted food so that the people working in the restaurants can eat it. Be yes, before it's put it into the before it yeah. Gets thrown out. Yeah, the gentleman's talking about diverting that waste before it even gets into the into the organics bin, which is great. Absolutely, I mean you have to look at a restaurant owner that's that's going to look at bringing on that sort of policy and practice for his staff. And you'll get a certain, you'll get waste diversion off the top, or you'll use someone like food runners to use the weight to, to take the food, as Aaron was mentioning. We heard about Quest and Food Runners is another local organization that will come and, and take food if the people working in the restaurant are eating it and it's still good. Question here. Hi, yeah, I've got uh, two questions. One for uh, Louise and one for Brian, uh, respectively. Uh, whatever sequence works. Um, for Louise, I was wondering. You, you mentioned about uh, contaminants. 
And I was just wondering what the general practice is. Uh, I mean, what, you know, from a practical business point of view, what are the most problematic? So, you know, how often does it, you know, what kind of issue comes up? Is it a temporary, long-term, whatever, and how do you deal with it? Uh, and then for Brian, the way you, your presentation was interesting, but it was a black box sale job. I mean, you, you talk about the technology, but it, it, there's, you, you didn't really say what's happening. And I would be interested in knowing technologically or, or chemically or whatever what's happening. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the technology itself is actually pretty simple. It, it is about optimizing a control environment for composting, which you need to follow in heat, an aerated environment, and moisture content. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is what the technology is really about. And, and what it does is when you put food waste into our, let's say, in-vessel composting machines, part of the things that it does is it actually has a little hose that sits on one end of the machine which draws fresh air into the machines. And there is a rotating instrument within the machines um, um, similar to the one from Earthtop, but except mm -hmm. that instead of having it being moved manually, it is actually being moved automatically. Uh, when, it, when it does that, uh, it creates an aerated environment, and since food waste normally contains up to 80 to 90 percent moisture content, we have actually another vacuum that sits on the opposite side end of the tank, which sucks out the moisture content. It goes through a pipe which connected to our deodorizers, and since uh, heat rises to the top, the deodorizer itself doesn't have any kind of automatic, so-called automatic system. It just raised to the top on its own automatically, uh, naturally, and that's how the whole system works. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. So it is a microbial process, in case people wonder. Yeah, okay. yeah. And in our case, with the, with the clients, working with the people, uh, what's key is the education piece and the information and working with the back of house staff so that they're very aware of what's okay and what's not. One of the reasons that we think the only way to work with this is small containers, toters, where you can begin to detect if there's any contamination or quality control issues. And the other thing we do is start to work upstream in the supply chain with, with uh, the site to see, just as Dr. Brown mentioned, if you can start to build out the category so that what... what procurement and purchasing is happening in the organization is compostable, then you really start to dramatically uh, increase your diversion rates and decrease the, the um, potential for contamination, stuff Great. that shouldn't get in there. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Peter's letting me do, to, do a shout out. This isn't uh, actually a question. Um, I'm sure every single person in this room has a backyard compost bin. And, uh, but if you live in Grandview Woodland, Kitsilano or Renfrew Collingwood and you don't have a compost bin in your backyard, it's your lucky night. Uh, I'm part of a team with EBA Engineering and we're working with the City of Vancouver to run three backyard composting pilots because we want more people growing compost right in their backyard where it's really local and they can grow food. Uh, so we have little flyers. We'll be stationed at the back at the end of the talk if you want to uh, get more information. We'll be happy to talk to you. We need volunteers. We need experienced composters as well. So um, check out our flyer. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brink. Is there another question there? Are, are you not waiting for questions? That's it? Please. Um, my question is for Louise. I'm kind of more curious about your management issues. So I'm wondering about how often pickup happens from the malls, where the totes are stored, and if you've ever had any problems with fruit flies or any other kind of pests, and what you would do to mitigate that or prevent that from happening. So one of the things is, with all, it, particularly in commercial collection, you're looking at high frequency, and that's why cost sometimes becomes a factor. So for example, in the case of the convention center, that pickup is every second day. We would, uh, we'll do nothing shorter than a week. Uh, because really uh, other issues with um, odor and, and just the decomposition start to occur. So it, it's, and, and one of the other considerations for the client is the space and the storage and how they're going to, um, where they're going to put all the, that to those totes and the equipment, especially if you're looking at back of house with a restaurant where they're looking at health and safety issues and other food handling protocols and also want to be moving this material out the back. So um, frequency is key and also that's one of the reasons we use the, the, the compostable liners. It helps mitigate that up to an extent but it's something you just want to keep moving very frequently. Is there anybody, anybody else on the, on the panel here wants to comment on that, that question? No? Okay. Um, 
Arzina. Okay, hi. Um, a question from an end user. So I'm, I'm asking on behalf of some of the urban farmers that I know um, who use, who need to purchase in organics um, for food production. Um, so I'm just, from, from what I, my own experience, um, we generally purchase composted manure at approximately $20 a yard. That's uh, about the rate that, that is generally used. And from what I've seen from finished compost prices, they are often starting at $35 a yard, which makes, you know, because I kind of heard something to say that we have so much more compost, we don't know what to do with it. You know, there is this uh, a burgeoning number of organic far farmers who would love to use this kind of material, but it's priced out of their range. Like at $35 a yard, that's starting to get really expensive. So wondering if you've got any ideas or what are some of the solutions to that side of things? Well, um, I think I can comment on that, Arzina. Um, you are referring to your um, tree food program uh, in Richmond? No, this is my own f yeah. my own farming. Well, um, because well, in this yeah. very case, we are actually located in Richmond, and um, thirty-five dollars is certainly not uh, the price range of um, the compost that we produce. So that's f far away, yeah. um, and uh, plus we are, are local. Um, however, having said that, um, there's a reason actually why we sell the compost. Um, I don't hide the fact that we make money on both sides: a on the tipping and b on the sell. But we can only have that model alive because, well, um, the, the tipping fee is lower than landfill cost. And um, it boils down to economic consideration of, um, of the cities. Uh, uh, one incentive is not only the fact that we recycle, but also one incentive is that it is cheaper. And um, this can only be done um, if um, the income is coming from the side of the sale. But again, to your um, $35 for, um, especially in um, Richmond, that's <laughs> certainly. So um, if you want, you can contact me after. Well, could yeah. <laughs> how, much do you, how much do you need? <laughs> <laughs> so, I yeah. so, I mean, there is yeah. there's certain... There's certainly a retail out. Um, there's a retail. I mean, I don't know. When you go to, um, if you go um, to a hardware store and buy this bagged soil products, if you calculate that um, per um, yard, you you pay hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred dollars, if you really make the the mathematics. Um, if you do the mathematics, but. Um, it depends. There's a retail, and the retail has its own, but if you buy it from sure. the, the wholesale company and for larger products, it's far away from that. Maybe a follow-up question, though, because, Can, I there's, mean, there's... There's, there's another, another comment Oh, sure. Here from somebody, from it, if you don't mind me commenting on that, Arzina, is all the composts have very specific uses, and most of them are not appropriate for organic farming. Yeah. So the ones that are available for organic food growing exercises are not plentiful, and many, the, since they're different types and they're processed in different areas, they're not always readily available or cheap. Now, mind you, I would dispute that 35 is expensive. It's expensive here, but in the rest of North America, it's not a p particularly expensive whatsoever. And if you examine it from a fertilizer value, it's extremely cheap. Now, the other thing is the cheap, plentiful compost that you see are high carbon-based uh, compost, which are not appropriate for food production, in my humble opinion. So all those things factor into it. And Dieter made an excellent point about bags, which is, frankly, buyer beware for growing your food, a lot of it. There's good stuff, but there's a lot of mediocre material. And if you did the extrapolation on a per yard basis, it'll end up somewhere between 100 to $250 per yard. So. so wondering if anyone's got something between 20 and 35. <laughs> well, we because quite frankly, I, you know, I can go to the, the landfill in Delta and get you know, a, a whole pickup truck for five bucks. But and I, I've done it before and I'm not going to do it again. Uh, because, you know, there's a quality issue of what comes out, that woody material that comes from the landfill. So I would, I, I'm not saying that urban farmers aren't willing to pay, but I think, you know, there, there's a market there that you're possibly not tapping into that will purchase 10, 20 yards at a time um, but I, A, you know, the pricing needs to be right, and B, um, you know, how do we get you? Like, there's, there, I don't think that connection's being made, so. 
Maybe the biomass trader can sort that one out. Oh, John's got a Another comment to, uh, to be made on that. It should be understood that if one buys an organic manure at $20 a yard, if one composted it, probably would only be half a yard. And so when we, when we sell a compost, it's actually much more concentrated than a manure itself. And again, it, as was mentioned by the others, we really need to understand the nutrient value and what it is we're buying. Question over here. Hello, I wanted to go back to the concept of mid-scale composting, especially in an urban context. There were a couple examples that were given through the presentations, but I'm curious to learn more about what can produce high-end quality product with the low carbon footprint in an urban setting. And I'm wondering if Dr. Brown has examples too from things that are happening in the States or if other folks on the panel could speak to that. Anybody got any answers on mid-scale composting that we haven't heard? Taylor? Yeah, well, with my experience, it's always uh, site-specific and each location has its own uh, factors that you have to consider. In the case where we're in Seashell, we have a lot of fish waste, which makes great soil. Um, but there's another site we're looking at that's right next to uh, a pumice mine, so you can look at making soil amendments by using some of that pumice with your compost on the back end. So I think it really depends where you're looking, and uh, the economics also have to work. That's the biggest challenge with small-scale composting, uh, because you're not usually talking, most of us here anyway, aren't talking about composting green waste. We're talking about composting food waste, which has pathogens in it, and as a result requires a lot of investment. So... Uh, really where you're going to see the, the, the European model, the small-scale or mid-scale composting in our cities are the municipalities that have the highest tip fee for garbage because that's usually where the composters will start building because they can save people money at a higher disposal cost. Um, anybody else have? Is, is there a minimum size of composter at which it becomes uneconomical or do you have, or do you have to factor in all those other tipping fees and so on? Because we've heard a lot about the management requirements and how finicky the whole thing is. Mm. How small can you get before it just gets ridiculous on the overhead? Well, uh, with, with the Gore cover system, I mean, we can make smaller jackets, smaller Gore-Tex jackets for less material, but you still need to have at least one person to operate the plant and one person to, you know, work the scale. So uh, you're going to have some minimum costs, and usually that's around 10,000 tons is usually the number that, that we use, and I think... John had mentioned one on the island, it's about that size, and, and Dr. Ember has one a little larger than that on the island. But uh, less than 10,000 tons really gets difficult unless you're um, going to have a bunch of volunteers working at the plant. They're trying to do that in Salt Spring you know, Island where they're very green and trying to do some of their own solutions. But it gets to be very expensive per ton, uh, and it starts to become a lot more affordable just to send it out somewhere else to have them process it. So really uh, about as small as you can go for the tough wastes, and my experience is about 10,000 tons per year. Uh, next question, please. Yeah. Oh. Uh, as a founder of a new startup here where we're designing uh, mid-scale composting for uh, communities, um, I'm wondering if anyone can talk about some of the carbon credit advantages of, of operating a composting facility here and whether you guys take advantage of those or whether that's just still kind of a dream. Because I know there's the potential there, as we had in the first talk, but just whether you guys use them. Yeah, there is a, a protocol which has been developed in Alberta, which I'm using on one of the uh, facilities right now. Dr. Ember may be further along with the process, but um, you get carbon credits only when you're going beyond the regulation. So if uh, a landfill has banned organics, you actually won't qualify for the organics. So you want them to sort of price out organics uh, restricted as a restricted waste. And then if the landfill has gas capture, like we have at uh, Cash Creek or at uh, Burns Bog, then you end up losing some of those credits as well because they're, they're collecting some of that methane. So uh, it's, a, it's a big protocol, a big equation you have to look at. And it does provide some value. The market's kind of gone a little bit soft recently, but you get about 10 to... $15 per ton um, of carbon, and uh, that definitely helps. Another thing which has uh, been a recent development is gas credits or gas tax. Um, a lot of municipalities can use their gas tax money for carbon-reducing initiatives, and actually the uh, band, the, the First Nations band in Seashelt, is using that gas tax money to fund part of the project 
because uh, they're going to be reducing their carbon footprint by composting the waste. And then they're going to use the return from that investment to build, we're building a half acre community farm. Uh, for the for the First Nations. So. Okay, so that fifteen dollars per CO two equivalent ton, um, how much does that equate to a ton of wet organic matter? Like how much? And what, are you going through Pacific Carbon Trust or offsetters or Pacific Carbon Trust? Yeah, and then there's uh, validators like offsetters or Blue Source or uh, there's a bunch of them that that then validate your equation. But so, per ton, so you'd have to look at uh, what type of material you're receiving, and then there's a it's an extensive calculation to look at how much you get, but roughly one ton per ton. Uh, again, ton per that's ton assuming that you're, if you're going to a landfill that has landfill gas collection, yeah. you lose some. And all of this changes by 2017 when uh, it's regulated that all landfills have gas collection in BC. Right. Well, that's, that's the big issue is that because they've regulated that there has to be gas capture, you can only get half of the carbon credits because the idea is if you've got gas capture, you're going to trap at least half of the methane that's coming off a landfill. Um, and the same thing is with, uh, um, with uh, diesel credits. Because they've legislated it has to be 5% uh, biodiesel, then until you've got to 5%, you can't get any carbon credits. But as soon as you're at 6%, you can get a carbon credit. So although the legislators are trying to help in terms of stimulating the industry, they're actually doing exactly the opposite. Okay, thank you so much. We have time for one last question. Yes, ma'am. One last person in line. Um, so my question, I'm, uh, with the, the proliferation of community gardens and the whole education of the public about food security, and um, so I, I'm interested in, and it seems to mesh really nicely with the city's um, composting of gr uh, garden waste, and um, so I, I recently became interested, found a, a community garden to be part of, and the piece of information that seems to be missing is I'm hearing about how important what's in the soil is and that good quality soil is important for growing food. And I haven't been able to find out um, when and if that um, soil that's delivered by the city to the community gardens is tested. I've spoken to a few people who run the community gardens and everybody's, well, like it comes from people's yards, yard waste, so nothing bad is going to be in there. But I spent a couple of hours as a volunteer um, shoveling that dirt into wheelbarrows and moving it around. And it smelled a bit of petroleum to me and it, that's what sort of got me asking the questions. So I'm wondering if anyone has any comments about the the composting of the yard waste and whether or not there's a, anyone knows of any controls or whether or not the general perspective is that that's safe and good and yeah. well something um, I can generally say about um, small scale composting is um, it's much more difficult um, to maintain the same um, uh, to meet the, the uh, comply with regulations because it's costly. Uh, as a composter, if uh, you have to, there are regulation, the organic matter regulation, or, and then you have permits on top of it that tell you how much of the material you have to be tested and how often and with frequency and what kind of process. And um, it's hard to meet that um, these requirements at, in a large, uh, small scale composter. And um, uh, but the city is it? Are they considered a small scale composter? Well, if it, if um, it's not so much the scale, it's um, their um, their testing mo um, um, program, which is important. You can be the smallest um, compost. I mean, I give you an example. If you have to test 1,000 tons or once in a year, whatever comes first, as a backyard compost, you will never reach 1,000 tons, right? So you send in your sample once in a year. What happens in between? Um, you never know what happens. I'm about the city's, the city's All right. T can I? Sorry. Yeah, it, I wouldn't, if I could be so forward and opinionated, I wouldn't use it for growing food. Because as Dr. Brown may speak better to this, but typical yard waste collection programs throughout North America, you know, your neighbor's saying, well, there's nothing wrong. Have we banned pesticides and herbicides completely throughout Vancouver yet?
the testing program, I don't know exactly. I haven't seen it very often or very consistent. It's very carbon-based material. It's not always... Okay, from if you, if I was growing food, I can't see who's talking. So the city of Vancouver's web page apparently has has the answer. Um, and the, we should, we should. the if the only thing I'll just quickly get off the mic here is OMRI regulations are excellent for food growing exercises, even if you're not growing organically specifically. Take a look at that. OMRI is Organic Matter Recycling Institute. It's a grandfather organization of many of the organic um, specifications that exist in urban and organic agriculture, and it provides excellent guidelines in terms of restricted, prohibited, and allowable materials in food production. So if you use that as a guideline and then refer back to it, I'm just not a big, I think the city compost is fantastic, not for food necessarily. Okay, well, we'll leave, we'll leave that one. Um, we're gonna wrap it up. Atlanta, do you wanna? I'd you love to ask a question. All right, one but last if, question. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm wondering if those of you that have a thriving compost businesses, what your opinion is, um, if you think it would be financially viable to partner with a smaller scale company that's would be in a town, let's say, like Vancouver. Um, but <laughs> I mean, I, I no, but I'm serious. But what I really want to know is your honest opinion. If you think if, if if you think it would be financially viable to partner with folks that are intricately in, uh, quite interwoven with community centers and neighborhood houses and potentially schools and so above single family homes, but more on a community scale. And what would it be like to to partner and collect compost on a smaller scale and then make compost so it's like, is that something that you think could be viable and I wonder if it would be viable where a comp like a company that had these connections made but then partnered and I don't know I would love your opinion on it what I, I think we kind of answered that didn't we, we did didn't you we talk about the not really answers or more answers I think the big problem is going to be your capacity is 10,000 tons you know I mean there's a lot of uh, other folks that are doing the collection, which is also another capacity issue. You have to have a certain amount to have it picked up and have a collection route. But uh, for processing, which is what I focus on, it, it's going to be a capacity issue if you have enough material to uh, build a facility to do the infrastructure that you need to process the tough stuff, the meat and cheese and fat. That's the Brian, well, just the, the smallest volume you can kind of deal with is a truck full. And so if you can find 10 tons of material from all of these small places and bring it to a central facility, that makes sense. Anything less than that really doesn't make sense. Yeah. Except for, yeah. I mean, we do, I mean, I mean, we do have the technology where the technology actually would come to you in a way that you could make sense to compost as little as a couple of kilo of food waste per day. Hello? There we go, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, I mean, we do have the technology where the technology would actually come to you in a way that you could compost as little as a couple kilo of food waste per day upward to 10, 15, 20 metric ton. But the biggest challenge is to come down to the user themselves, which is, what are we going to do with the compost? They don't want to have anything to do with it. I mean, as much as we, we think everybody is really much into composting, but the people that we talk to out in the field that are working in hotels, that are working in restaurants, they perceive themselves as a hotel worker per se. So all of a sudden, they now got this new piece of machines, even though it's extremely user friendly. But the challenge is, what are they going to do with the compost? And there has to be some way of looking after those composts. So composting on site makes sense, but where it doesn't make sense from an economic point of view is that then you have to organize a logistic platform and infrastructure to offload these composts from these machines and as well as to take these composts somewhere to store it over the winter months. And that I, I is think where you should be talking to Brian's clients. <laughs> it sounds like they're looking for some place to put their compost. Yeah.
Uh, we're going to let the rest of the conversations happen offline, and, and uh, thank you to the online visitors. Thank you so much to all our panel. Big hand for the panel. <laughs> Dr. Sally Brown, all the way from Seattle, and. Uh, Again, thanks to the Real Estate Foundation, Van City, Nature's Path Organic, and uh, Brenda Tang at the Center for Dialogue, who helped okay. really put this thing together. <laughs> and transform compost products from John Paul. 